Welcome to LISACON 2021, the fourth edition of LAS Academy's annual conference 2021 on the all encompassing and overarching concept, what is called open scholar libraries. A very novel vision of democratizing knowledge. That is what is open scholarship is all about. The mission is information for all and knowledge for all. And the underlying principles of the open scholarship is equity, inclusivity, and access to knowledge. Because knowledge is a public good and it should be accessible and it should be equitable and it should be inclusive. The open scholarship comprise of open access publishing, open education, and open education resources, open science and open data, open research and open innovation, and the most interesting open source and the process of opening up the source codes to the user community, irrespective of, uh, I mean, across borders and uh, irrespective of uh, time and space. In today's discussion, I am focusing on the open access publishing. And in particular, the changing landscape of scholarly communication ecosystem. Looking at the contours of green, gold, and the diamond rules. Friends, the domain of scholarly communication has been under the influence of technology. In fact, technology has been instrumental in bringing phenomenal and revolutionary changes in the publishing and scholarly publishing, in particular, the ecosystem. We will discuss this in detail. In today's discussion, I'm going to focus on the publishing focus process, the upcoming models, the scholarly publishing overview, the publishing crisis that this humanity is facing, especially the scientific community is facing, especially the scholarly publishing crisis, and then the open access uh, concept and the overview of open access and the different models, working principles and the examples that are uh, there. And then uh, resource discovery that is available for open access, uh, you know, meaningful uh, discovery. And then the national and international initiatives and the growing acceptance of open access uh, say movement. And then the myths and misconceptions about Actually, science is actually humanity's uh, biggest collaborative effort. And it's all about, uh, you know, connecting the building blocks of ideas, the findings, the new findings and the, the new, you know, developments that uh, we bring to the domain of, uh, you know, body of knowledge. And then uh, it's all about, uh, you know, how to bring in uh, the, the new developments and then the new findings as a piece of uh, new, you know, documentation. And that is the practice of science that we see. So in other words, science is a massively parallel human endeavor. In science, knowledge is acquired cumulatively and collaboratively. In the, institu the institution of uh, scholarly publishing, is the principal mode for uh, sharing knowledge. And in science, ideas are built upon ideas, models upon models, 
verification upon prior verifications. And the advancements in subjects is carried on by the studies based on the findings of prior studies. And this process, this cumulative process of construction leaves a lattice work of citations. And if I would like to define what is research, research is to see what everybody else has seen and to think what nobody else has thought. If I can quote Alberts and Georgi, there are various stakeholders in the domain of scholarly information, especially in the publishing of scholarly information. They comprise authors, the information producers, publishers, the information providers, consumers, the users as such, and then again providers like libraries and intermediaries. And then we have a lot of aggregators, vendors, and agents. So they play around as intermediaries to where uh, I mean, be acting as providers. And if you look at the vehicles of scholarly communication, and the there are two types of uh, vehicles. One is the uh, unpublished uh, scholarly communication, which we call it as ephemeral, and then there is the formal published one. So let me just tell you what of what is about ephemeral unpublished. They comprise of working papers, technical reports, lecture notes, coursewares classroom presentations, social media discussions, and the like. Formal published types include journals, conference symposium proceedings, books and monographs, cases, patents, and so on. The traditional publishing model has been very, you know, uh, recent and uh, matured. And uh, scientific journals are the major communication modes, and they are commercial entities. Scientists submit their articles and publish for free. Scientists do their peer review for free. And journals make money through publications, through subscriptions. So when you look at why researchers publish their work, as this diagram very clearly shows, it's all about, uh, it's all for communicating the results of uh, their interesting findings to the peers. That comes first. And then uh, the second uh, in the order is uh, the advancements of career. And then they publish for personal prestige. And then people publish, scientists publish for uh, gaining funding. And then if you look at the financial reward part of it, it is the least and the last one they are looking for. So look at the challenges that are being faced by, you know, the, the publishing fraternity, uh, especially from the point of view of users. There are two challenges that the users are facing with respect to access to literature, scientific literature, world-class scientific literature. They are the research journal affordability problem because the cost of each journals each and every journal is skyrocketing day by day. And then the library budgets are diminishing every year. So naturally, the, uh, the, the number of journals subscribed to by the universities, by the libraries are coming down every year. And then the second most interesting challenge, most pressing challenge is the research, research article access impact problem. It's because of this, uh, the second, because of the first problem, the second problem arises. That is the research article access impact problem. So here's a very interesting, uh, you know, uh, cartoon given by the Public Library of Science. I would like to draw your attention to what it is written. What is written here? You write the papers. You review the papers. Then why should you pay to read them? So this is a very interesting question. And these people are actually trying to catch the journal which is uh, hung above their reach. So this speaks volumes. So looking at the uh, present scenario of publishing, as I was mentioning earlier, technology has been actually driving this field quite phenomenally and revolutionarily. And then almost all 
publications, almost all entire gamut of publishing is actually happening online, digital. So the publishing is digital, transmission is digital, consumption is through digital modes and devices and like that. If you look at the principal interlocking channels of scholarly publishing, they are basically comprising of subscription-based journals, open access journals, and repositories. That is, institutional repositories are otherwise called open access archives. So if you interlock these three chunks, you get the Yender scholarly publishing domain. So the open access idea is to make public all scientific efforts that should be that is produced globally. So that is the overarching idea. So if you, if, if you look at Wikipedia, you get uh, an idea about open access is a social movement in academia dedicated to the principle of open access to information sharing for the common good. So the salient features of open access uh, is open access is free online and it facilitates immediate accessibility of scholarly research articles for use as well as it gives reuse rights. Very interesting uh, provision. And then publications must be published under an open license, preferably the Creative Commons Attribution License, which is uh, fondly known as CCBY. You can add more attributions. You can add more clauses or restrict clauses so that uh, it is reaching to the user community as you desire. Now, lot of initiatives, lot of declarations, lot of uh, statements, principles, guidelines have been, we all have been seeing, uh, witnessing during the past two decades. Actually, it all started with the Budapest Open Access Initiative uh, on December 1st and 2nd in 2001, when they very clearly said that open access is all about uh, either self-archiving, that is the scholars should be able to deposit their refereed journal articles in openly available electronic, uh, you know, access, uh, archives, open access archives, and they should also conform to OAI standards. And then the second mode is open access journals, which is called the, 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 the golden route to open access publishing, and the journals will not charge subscriptions or fees for online access. Instead, they should look for other sources to fund peer review. Example, publication charges. Who are benefiting from the open access movement? Uh, scientists as authors, scientists as readers, scientists as teachers, universities, research funders, taxpayers, and society at large, publishers, you know, this is a very interesting proposition. When we say publishers are benefited out of this open access. Otherwise, the locked up content may not be reaching the users. So the allowed version of the open access of the article reaches the user, makes a, uh, you know, real change. And if they are really interested, they will in turn start subscribing to the journal also. So that's actually directly promoting and, uh, you know, marketing their own uh, um, journals, just they should understand that. And then if you look at the multiple benefit of open access publishing, as I was mentioning earlier, it gives an enormous exposure to your work. Uh, practitioners can uh, apply uh, your findings. Uh, it definitely gives you more citation rates. Um, your research can influence policies. Uh, public can access your findings. Uh, uh, you can comply with the uh, grant uh, funders, uh, you know, uh, rules uh, or guidelines. Uh, then you have, uh, you're assuring taxpayers so that uh, they get value for their money. And then uh, uh, most importantly, researchers in the developing countries can see your work. So this is actually a very interesting proposition. Uh, I mean, open access is the offering to the uh, world outside. Looking at the different routes, uh, models of uh, open access, uh, we have the golden road, what is called, otherwise golden route, what is called the open access publishing um, 
the golden road um, then there is something called uh, the diamond road which is fully open access publications uh, i will come to this in detail and then the third route is actually the green road uh, which is open access archives road so let me just uh, re recap the whole thing like uh, we have the golden road where uh, open access publishing is promoted that is uh, your uh, articles are published in an open access journal and uh, the diamond road which is fully open access publications which means that uh, uh, no charge at any point in time at any life cycle of the publication is charged from the uh, from either the users or the, or the universities and even the even the uh, authors and uh, open access archives the green road right and then uh, let me come to the gold model details sir. So in the gold model, as I was mentioning, it is open access publishing journals. Um, the other side payment models are very uh, prominent. Um, there are individual and collective funder models available. For example, coalition S and planners models, etc. Um, I'll come to planners in detail because planners is uh, not just uh, funder models of gold only. Uh, and then institution-based community support uh, supported open access publishing. Um, then article processing charges, APC model, where the, the, the journal will be charging, uh, publishing, uh, you know, charge, processing charge, article processing charge from the author, or it can be factored into the, the author's, uh, you know, uh, grand of what he is enjoying, or it can be, by the uh, university or the institution where he is working. Um, then APC is supported by scholarly societies, libraries, foundations, and research centers uh, or other subsidies. Um, then the interesting model, what is called a new, uh, you know, very interesting strategic model, what is called the transformative agreements, um, uh, which, uh, you know, uh, looks at partnership building uh, deals uh, with the uh, the, the, the publishers, we call it as, uh, there are two models in that. One is read and publish. The other one is, uh, you know, publish and read. So we'll come to these in detail. Um, so looking at the read and publish model, uh, uh, it's a new strategic initiative which is collectively partnered with the scholarly publishers uh, through an agreement. Um, the publisher receives uh, payment for reading as well as payment for publishing. I'll repeat. The publisher is assured of payment for reading and payment for publishing uh, and is bundled into a single contract. It's a very interesting contract which takes care of entire, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the interests of the uh, university, the library, looking at a uh, transition uh, from subscription to uh, open access uh, models. So it's a very win-win situation to... Uh, um, you know, the budget eating uh, journal subscriptions. Uh, so that's very, very important. So it's a transitional strategy integrating journal subscription charges and publishing charges. And the ultimate objective motive is actually to make the whole process open access. So the overarching goals of uh, uh, read and publish is to transform the economy of the scholarly publishing. And it promises so. Uh, libraries better understand the research and publishing impact on their researches and resources. Um, the other model along with the transformative agreements is the publish and read model, uh, which, uh, I mean, it's again an agreement in which the publisher receives payment only for publishing and uh, reading is included uh, for no additional cost for this. Um, the goal is again to attain a cost neutral contract in comparison with the subscription based uh, reading agreement uh, or uh, you know diminishing the price uh, which is actually otherwise spent on subscriptions the most ideal model is the, the diamond open access uh, publishing model uh, where it, it can be otherwise called gold plus model uh, it follows absolute not for profit publishing practice and rules out any cost for publishing and it calls for substantial investments and corpus of resources in order to remain status quo and to be sustainable so this is actually the uh, you know the, the, the 
additional responsibility with respect to um, diamond open access. Um, a word about planners uh, 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 by the uh, European uh, Science Foundation worth mentioning here. Because planners uh, is looking at, uh, um, you know, I mean, mandates that scholarly publications on the research from research funded by public or private grants provided by national, regional, or international research council and funding bodies must be published in open access journals or on open access platforms or made mandatorily available through open access repositories without any embargo. I think this is a very strong mandate and their ambition is to attain uh, a full open access uh, to the entire uh, European region within a very short span of time by pumping in thousands of uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars into the publishing industry. There are various uh, debates going on this particular model. Let us wait and see how best this is going to take place and let us uh, wish them all success. And there is something called hybrid OA model. Um, this hybrid OA model uh, is mostly uh, followed by commercial paywall publishers, which allow select articles to be made open access in their journal issues by charging the authors a fee. So that means uh, some of the articles uh, in the uh, journal issue will be free to read and some of them may not be free to read. This is also known as, this model is also known as paid open access uh, model. Um, and uh, this means that in the same issue uh, or in the journal, the remaining articles uh, will be available only through, uh, I mean, can be accessed only through a subscription. Uh, here I am showing some of the uh, growing, uh, I mean, uh, showcasing the gro growing acceptance of open access publishing. Uh, you can see that almost all uh, uh, leading uh, world renowned publishers are now having open access uh, collections. Uh, that is not to say that all their journals are open access, some of their journals, a few of their journals, but this is an increasing concept now. Uh, there was a bit of, um, I will say, there was a strong resistance in the uh, early days, uh, maybe during the first decade, maybe up to 2010. But after that, they understood the strength, the influence, the impact of open access movement, and then they started embracing this movement uh, gradually. So this is a very interesting, uh, you know, uh, example of how open access has been able to gain ground and getting accepted by the most renowned publishers of the world. I don't want to mention names here, but almost all you know, leading publishers are here. Um, and then from the Indian context also, most of our uh, renowned scientific academies, research councils are now opening up their content. There are uh, also uh, interesting models that have emerged from the public-private uh, partnership especially private uh, entities have come um, with uh, no profit motives. Uh, Metno Publications is now, uh, you know, allaying with or uh, collaborating with uh, uh, Clover. So I think uh, this is a very interesting uh, movement that is uh, coming up in India, both on the gold as well as, uh, you know, the, the green routes. I would like to give a word of caution, uh, especially about the predator, predatory journals that are, uh, you know, disguising as uh, open access public, open access journals, uh, uh, and coming up for help uh, to the uh, scientific fraternity. There are thousands of journals online, but all of, but not all are what they seem to be. So we have to be very, very careful while giving your. Uh, so beware of organizations you have never heard of. Uh, they are guaranteeing your publication, whatsoever be your article. Um, the editor is also the owner of the uh, journal. Uh, there, you know, there is no editorial information. Um, and then these journals uh, publish almost everything, uh, you know, in one journal, what is called a very broad scope. Uh, uh, so they are to be very carefully uh, dealt with. Uh, how to identify these predatory journals? There are uh, interesting uh, 
services which are available. One such service I would like to recommend you all is the BR's list. Uh, the BR's list gives uh, the list of predatory journals, hijacked journals, and uh, uh, those having misleading metrics, uh, false impact metrics that are being um, propagated. And then uh, Cabell's blacklist. Uh, this is a paid access service. Uh, so I would request you to uh, have a look at uh, both these things. Uh, and whenever you are in doubt about the quality or the authenticity, the authority of a journal, kindly be in touch with your librarian and uh, he or she will be in a position to help you. So I'm just showing you the screenshots of the BR's uh, list. Um, and then coming to the uh, green route, the open access archiving route, um, so archiving is a process of submitting a research article into a, an e-print archive. Um, submissions can be done by the author uh, or by author's representative or a library. So here I am giving you um, the uh, resource discovery sources for open access literature. Uh, I'll start with uh, the directory of open access journals, which is listing over uh, 17,000 uh, you know, journals. I will not say all these journals are uh, high-ranked journals or highly authentic journals. At least at least 40% uh, of this uh, 17,295 can be taken uh, you know, with uh, seriousness. Uh, at least 10 percentage can be of uh, very high, uh, you know, impact factor and, uh, you know, uh, authority. Um, then we have uh, earlier, I have seen that open J gate was there, but I think open J gate is now called off. Uh, I have to inquire that. And then there is open DOAR, what is called uh, Directory of Open Access uh, Resources. Uh, repositories, uh, directory of open access repositories. It is it is listing 5,800 plus open access archives. Then we have the registry of open access repositories. It has got uh, 4,100 plus open access archives plus a um, lot of uh, millions of resources uh, available. And then Oyster, uh, which is which is uh, uh, able to provide. Uh, 1,500 plus open access archive plus uh, over 30 million reports. I mean, uh, you know, what is called the um, uh, scholarly resources. And there is, uh, there are so many. I'm just uh, giving you a, an indicative list of uh, um, such resources. So I'm giving you, showing you also the screenshots of the uh, Director of Open Access Journals, Director of Open Access Repositories. Um, the registry of open access repositories here and then uh, the oyster database uh, which is very useful you can search here also this is uh, supported by and run by oclc then uh, whenever you are working on open access repositories it is better to see the uh, you know uh, the publishers uh, norms uh, guidelines with respect to archiving um, they are having policies of these publishers and uh, um, JISC, the Joint Information Systems Council of UK. Um, earlier, this was operated by, for serviced by uh, Nottingham University. Now it is run by uh, JISC. So the JISC uh, uh, Sherpa project is giving uh, uh, these two services. One is uh, the publisher's uh, um, archiving policies. Um, what is called the service, the directory is called Romeo. And then there is something called uh, Juliet which gives uh, the funding agencies, uh, you know, uh, guidelines with respect to uh, open access compliance. So I think Sherpa Romeo and uh, Sherpa Juliet, these are very important uh, directories and uh, guidelines that uh, uh, librarians and uh, authors should be aware of. Uh, and I think as librarians, it's our responsibility to, to publicize this particular information. Uh, there are a lot of myths and uh, misconceptions about open access. Uh, um, some of the um, interesting uh, allegations that are leveled against open access is that one, uh, open access articles are free and hence uh, they lack value. This has been disproved already, uh, you know, with the kind of uh, uh, high ranking journals that are available in the open access domain. For example, the Public Library of Science uh, um, uh, Cell Biology is enjoying uh, the, the uh, you know, 
the impact factor as good as uh, maybe nature or anything of that sort. So uh, can't say that uh, for the reason that it is free, it is uh, lacking value. And then the OI articles are not copyrighted, which is also not correct. I have already told you it is uh, articles. I mean, OA, open access publishing is all about uh, making your content open with a, uh, you know, particular copyright, what is called uh, open, uh, I mean, Creative Commons uh, uh, copyright uh, licensing, uh, which allows open access. And I was telling you that uh, uh, Creative Commons license has got many attributions that you can add with a lot of uh, opening up for possibilities as well as restrictions. There is no peer review for OA. This is the third allegation that is leveled. So, which is also not correct. Um, any seriously run journal is having their own peer review process and very seriously, very, very, um, you know, systematically done. Um, the fourth uh, allegation uh, we used to hear is that OA journals do not high, have high impact factor, which I have already uh, mentioned earlier. Uh, just to uh, mention about the uh, the, the, the Public Library of Science journals, that is plus one journal, plus journals. And then there is uh, Biomed Central. Then there are enough uh, of, uh, you know, examples from the you know, scholarly publishing uh, fraternity I have uh, already uh, shown you earlier. And then the last one, which I would like to uh, I mean, um, um, share is actually OA will only harm the publishing ecosystem, uh, which is also not correct. Uh, open access is not going to harm the publishing ecosystem. In fact, it is going to strengthen uh, and uh, iron out the, the, the strength of uh, the, the open access uh, publishing because um, open access publishing uh, envisages 100% open access to the, the, the scholarly content to the user community. But at the same time, the OEA fraternity also know that this cannot happen as a free lunch. You have to uh, invest money for, uh, you have to incur a cost for uh, uh, the publishing process, especially with respect to peer reviews and uh, uh, the, the publishing uh, process. There is no printing here because open access is all about, uh, you know, what is called electronic publishing. So the claim that OEA will harm the public publishing ecosystem is uh, not uh, you know not at all correct i think uh, uh, over the years open access is going to gain enormous uh, you know uh, acceptance uh, from the user community uh, thank you so much for your patient listening uh, if there are any questions i'll be happy to take thank you very much